for week 12 lecture, we will be going over buildings and equipment. This lecture has been developed um, from lecture materials that I received from Dr. Jennifer Gill. Um, so the structure may be set up a little bit different in your slides, but as far as covering content, how our questions will be laid out and so forth, that will all follow the same structure that I followed throughout the previous part of the semester. One change that I'm going to make to this lecture is I'm only going to post one lecture this week. So we'll just have a week 12 lecture. We won't have a week 12A and 12B. Instead of having five questions on your assignment for this week, you'll have 10 questions. So you will still have the opportunity to earn five points from each assignment. It'll just be combined. You'll have one 10 point assignment based on this lecture. Then in lab this week, we will do a facilities evaluation, cover the information um, that was covered throughout the duration of this lecture. Since I'm only posting one lecture and not two this week, um, it was posted late, but in addition to that, week 14 is the week of your presentations. I posted that early, early on in the semester and gave you the option to submit your topics early to get those approved. So you have the timeline, you have the deadlines for what will be due during week 14. Make sure that you're looking ahead to that. Make sure that you're selecting and submitting a topic to me to get approved. I already have three people with approved topics so far. I've warned that it is difficult to Record your presentation and upload them to YouTube, making sure that your technology is working, making sure that you know how to record on PowerPoint. Um, if you haven't done that before, it does take a little bit of time. Make sure you start early. So this is my first caution to start early. It's posted, it's available, balls in your court. So since you only have one lecture this week, you should have additional time to be looking at that week 14, making sure that you're prepared. So given the opportunities here, I don't want to have any excuses uh, for submitting these presentations late. So keep that in mind um, as we move forward throughout this lecture with buildings and equipment. As for the learning outcomes, um, I did go ahead and include those because these are really good. Um, if you can outline the learning outcomes, then you're definitely going to do well. Um, as far as the exam for questions. So went ahead and left those in there. So our learning outcomes are going to recognize um, basic considerations used in planning the construction of a barn um, to describe the three basic floor plans of barns. So this is the single row stalls, the central alley, and then the island layout. And we'll get deeper into that as we go throughout the lecture. And then to describe the characteristics of the six types of general framing styles of barns, to recognize common building materials and their respective advantages and disadvantages, as well as to describe characteristics of horse stalls. Um, this could include, but wouldn't be limited to, the appropriate dimensions, the door and window considerations, uh, flooring considerations, as well as feeder and water, different options that are available there. So to begin with, we have our basic construction planning considerations. We want to consider not only the safety of our horses, but also the safety of the humans that are going to be working in that facility um, or participating in different activities within the facility. This can include uh, minimizing sharp projections and corners, minimizing slick flooring. The minimizing slick flooring, I... I always think that's a very important one. A lot of times we don't think about the fact um, that our horses that are shoed, that they do have a, a metal shoe on their hoof. And so walking on um, different surfaces can be um, very slick for them. So we want to make sure that we're making that consideration. I know there's a, a place in Stephenville when I was completing my graduate work and um, at, we were all at Twisted J one night and somebody thought, oh, it'll be fun to bring my horse inside. And it was really fun and cool until the floor was slick because it wasn't designed for a horse um, and his horse went down. So slick flooring is definitely something um, that I think is overlooked at times that we need to consider. 
Um, and then also that there's adequate space um, for horses and handlers so that we're making total use of our space and that that provides um, safety for both. And then there's also a number of environmental controls. Um, we want to make sure that we're preventing temperature extremes. So depending on what part of the country that um, you're living in or what area you're in, that could be um, could be making sure that our barns stay cool. It could be making sure that our barns stay warm. So we want to make sure that the insulation and ventilation um, is proper. And then we want to ensure that our animals are protected against the elements. So again, that's one of our our main goals in having a facility. And then we want to assess prevailing winds and orientation of the stable itself. So with that being said, it's important that you know the lay of your land, you know the way of which your um, weather is going to flow through your barn. If you have a barn um, positioned incorrectly or especially if you have a, um, a lean-to um, placed incorrectly, then sometimes you're not going to actually be um, protecting our horses against their elements because um, the rain and the wind is going to um, going to enter um, into that facility if it's not placed correctly. So all considerations that um, go into the initial um, construction planning of a facility. Next, we want to look at pasture considerations. So we've talked about um, nutritionally how it's healthier for our horses to be out to pasture instead of a lot of modern management um, systems that require our horses to be in confinement and consume grain. So we want to make sure that we look at pasture considerations, um, the close proximity to the barn, um, how large the pastures are, how many horses you can graze, um, as well as the type of grass that's available. We talked about how clover um, can have some undesirable results or undesirable um, consequences in horses in um, late summer. And then we've also talked about how feeding um, fescue hay to brood mares can be very detrimental um, to the mare and also to the foal. So you want to look at what type of grass um, is growing in those pastures. Are there any hazards? Um, I know one that really comes to mind living um, in Bowling Green. We have a lot of cave systems and sinkholes around here. Um, so I know personally that my pastures at home that we've had to do a, a lot of modifications and temporary fencing because of sinkholes that have fallen through. So making sure that you're evaluating um, those pastures for different hazards that may present themselves to the horses over time. And then ensuring that um, water and shelter is available to our horses. So in these pastures, um, are lean-tos going to be available? Um, are there trees that can provide for shelter? Will the horses need to be um, brought into your barn facility? Um, as far as water, is there um, a water spigot close by? Is there uh, a pond in the pasture? Um, is there is there opportunity um, to easily transport water um, to those pastures for our horses? Um, we want to ensure uh, when looking at a facility um, that we have adequate space for design. So adequate um, for the purpose of the facility and then also um, is there still space and opportunity for growth within the future? Um, however, we want to ensure that we don't have access space because having um, too much facility um, can oftentimes result in additional cost um, that would not be desirable. And then ventilation. Um, ventilation is very important for a number of reasons. I know we hit on that pretty early on as far as um, preventing temperature extremes with insulation as well as with um, proper ventilation. And so ventilation is also going to help to minimize older buildup. And this can be a health concern for both horses and humans. So making sure that ventilation is proper um, in our barns and in our stalls. And then ventilation can also assist in minimizing moisture buildup. So the first thing that excess cobwebs um, is going to tell us, obviously, there's spiders present. Um, so simple short answer. Um, but it also can mean that we do have um, ventilation issues within the facility. And the, the increased instances of cobwebs and not making sure that those are adequately cleaned out 
is going to result in having um, a fire a fire hazard. Um, ultimately, barns already have have many things that need to be considered because it can very quickly turn into a fire hazard um, if an unfortunate event is to occur. And so cobwebs are going to be um, another one of those that we want to make sure that they are present in our facility, um, that we are keeping those cleaned and removed. So that brings us right into fire risk. Um, like I said, barns are if we put hay in them, if we're storing hay above the horses, um, there's 101 things that lend themselves to a facility being a fire risk. Um, with that being said, I have also attached a supplemental material for this week. Um, not necessarily testable because um, you'll get the information you need from this presentation, but some unique information um, if you would be be interested in, in reviewing that. So I've attached that as supplemental material. Um, but we want to ensure that our facility, that we do have fire alarms, um, that we have fire suppression, um, that we have a fire resistant building materials that are being used, that um, fire retardant paint is used, and also um, consider where hay and bedding is stored. It's recommended that hay and bedding not be stored um, in the same facility that your horses be housed. It's also recommended um, that it not be stored overhead in a loft. Um, so in a perfect world, an ideal world, um, we would have a um, separate facility um, for storage of hay. I understand that sometimes that's not always possible um, with what's available, but ideally um, it should be located within a different facility. As far as the um, aesthetic value, you want to ensure that your facility is appealing, um, whether that be for tours or for attracting different clients, um, but also the aesthetic value um, oftentimes lends itself to a clean barn. Um, so the photographed here, this is a very, very nice facility and rather over the top for many of our needs. Uh, however, it's important that regardless of the value or the niceness of the facility, it's important that we're taking care of that facility. Um, taking care of and having a clean facility, even if it's not over the top, um, is a lot of times going to give you an upper hand in, in many different um, areas. The next thing we want to consider is our different features that are available. So do we have a grooming and saddling area? Um, this can be um, separated or similar to at Western. We use our alleyways um, to ensure that we can cross tie our horses and safely groom and saddle. Are there restrooms available? Um, I know all of us being horse people, if a time or two we use the trailer or other facility. Um, so ensuring that you have a restroom facility available in your barn um, is ideal. Um, to ensure there's areas to um, rinse and wash the horses. And then is, we would also consider um, if there was a need for an office, a lounge, um, or further living quarters. Um, here at Western, we have a number um, of office areas or lab um, facility areas that are available at our disposal. Um, and I know previously, um, where I completed my master's at in Tarleton, we actually had living quarters um, available in our barn facility. So you always had um, staff on site overnight. Um, and that was very ideal when we were going through foaling season. So for breeding barns, um, living quarters would absolutely be something um, desirable. I know today we have lots of technology at our, at our disposal. Um, we, can, um, we can hook up cameras in our foaling stalls. But again, ideal if we have someone on site to act quickly. Our next consideration is going to be labor efficiency. Um, so we can have stalls and we can have pastures, but how can we design the facility to be most labor efficient? Um, so that's going to be based on labor efficiency and also the needs of the horses on site. So are the horses going to live in stalls all the time? Um, are they going to be outside 24-7 or inside and outside? Um, and coming into play with that, 
Um, is this going to be a facility that you care for yourself or are you planning to hire staff um, to assist with care? Um, keeping our horses in stalls, like I mentioned before, um, nutritionally isn't, isn't ideal to do it 24 hours a day. Um, but in situations, it, it is required. Um, the, that's what's available and um, for many need, there may be some needs of the horse that require that. Um, however, the use of stalls is often time consuming. Um, you have to bed the stalls, you have to clean the stalls. Um, and so use of stalls comparative to other methods can be very time consuming. Um, so a couple of alternates um, that can be considered is um, the use of runouts. So pictured here you can see that there is either a stall in the end of the barn or a run to or a lean to and then the horse has a run out. So the horse is able to um, travel from the the run out um, into the stall throughout the day as it pleases. Um, so a couple of different alternatives available and considerations that should be made to ensure that you can use your labor force most efficiently, whether that be yourself or yourself um, and hired help. Um, next we have the distance um, that is cleared from the floor to the ceiling of our facility. So the minimum um, clearing distance that we want to have is eight foot. Um, however, it is more common to have a 10 foot um, clearing distance from floor to ceiling. A higher ceiling is going to provide um, more light and is also going to provide better ven ventilation. Um, however, having a higher ceiling, it can also mean that this facility is going to be um, colder in the winter months. So making sure that you're making that consideration depending on um, the needs of your facility and also the location of your facility dependent on the weather. Then we want to ensure that water and electric and utility access is available. In placement of outlets and um, water spigots, we want to ensure that they are placed where they can be most beneficial to the facility, but that they are also um, placed in safe locations. And then as for storage and organization, um, the storage and organization of the different tools and different things that our horses need, we want to ensure um, it is done so safely. We also want to er, ensure that it, it has a security feature. So can this um, facility be locked if need be, um, whether that be the feed room or it be the tack room? Um, can that be um, locked and secured if need be? And then also we want to make sure and storage and organization that we consider the functionality. Um, the right hand um, sign or photograph of the sign was actually taken at a conference um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We went there for the Equine Science Symposium a few years back and I recall going into this facility and it says that good housekeeping is the keynote to safety, cleanliness, order, and a place for everything are essential to safety. And so I think a lot of times that's something that is overlooked. Um, it's just seeing that maybe we're, we're a little too particular about organizing things and keeping it in its spot. But ultimately, keeping the facility clean and keeping everything organized is truly um, comes into play in our safety measures at the facility. Now we're ready to move into the basic barn floor plans. Um, so make sure that you go ahead and outline the, um, the benefits or also the drawbacks of these different floor plans. So the first one is a single row. Um, looking at a single row of stalls, this is going to be the least amount of covered space. It is going to be low cost. Um, ventilation is generally good, and however, people are oftentimes not protected um, from the weather. For the central alley um, between the stalls, the um, this design uses very efficient use of the interior space. 
Um, it is more efficient stall cleaning and feeding um, as you can have your wheelbarrow or your tractor and um, your manure spreader and you can you can go down that center alley and so it's going to make it very efficient um, as far as cleaning and feeding needs. It is going to um, protect individuals from the elements and then it can also have um, a door to the outside. As for the island layout, the alley can be used to cool or exercise horses. Um, however, this can dust can create an issue. So with the island layout, the alleyway is going to be um, the outside perimeter since those stalls are um, stalls are on the interior in an island style. There's going to be a lack of sunlight because the stalls are in the center. So we can't easily um, install windows per se so that we have good um, light and also can help with ventilation. Um, ventilation can also be an issue because there's no exterior exposure of the stalls. And then it is going to be the least efficient um, use of space. As for the general barn framing styles, um, we have a shed. So our shed is sometimes used um, in larger barns, but it is very common when we're um, designing lean-tos. There's also a gabble, and then a offset gabble, a gabrielle, gambrielle, excuse me, a gothic, and then a monitor. So those are the six different types of general framing styles. To look at those different styles a little more in depth, um, we'll look at the shed. The shed is often used on open front buildings and it can be used on small closed front buildings. Um, it is often used as an attachment to a larger building, so you already have an existing barn you want to do an extension so it would be very common um, commonplace for creating a additional attachment and expanding the current facility and this style is often low cost and is very simple to build as for the um, gavel it is the most widely used um, depending on how you lay it out, there is a number of options that are available um, that you can see in this diagram. But it, it accommodates a number of different configurations. Um, it is flexible in terms of widths. Um, it can accommodate a relatively large range of widths as well. It is, runs about middle of the line as far as cost. Again, it's going to be fairly simple to build. Um, and the eave and ridge ventilation provide good ventilation for our horses. So that design is going to be ideal in providing good ventilation to the facility. Um, and then also the um, translucent roof panels provide good natural lighting um, in these situations when this style um, barn framing is used. Um, next we have a offset gavel. So again, it's going to be similar to the previous one that we went over, but it's going to be offset. Um, it is usually used for a small building or a single row of stalls, and it is similar to the shed, but allows for storage and human shelter. Next, we have the gambrel and the gothic. So the gambrel is on the left and the gothic is on the right. Um, they are similar in the fact that they are used for two-story barns. So we'll have our facility on the first floor and then we'll have a loft area um, on the second floor. So that loft area, um, it's common to be used for hay storage. And I know in some more recent facility designs, um, sometimes that loft area is used for a living quarters portion. Um, it has the convenience relative to feeding, especially if that hay storage is done on the second floor. Um, however, it is going to be a potential fire hazard if that hay is stored within the same facility of our horses. Um, it is not the easiest to fill in terms of labor um, and separate hay storage would be ideal. 
Um, and ventilation and lighting can also be an issue with these facilities being designed as two-story. And then finally, we have the monitor. Um, this is a combination of two sheds and a gabel. It has great ventilation and lighting, and some, um, some designs will incorporate a loft for hay storage within this facility. Now we're ready to move into common building materials. Um, so our first most common building material is going to be wood. Um, the advantages is going to be appearance. Um, it's also easy on the feet and legs of kicking. So if we have a horse um, that is to, to kick at a barn wall or star, stall um, wall, it, it's going to be sturdy. Um, but it's not going to it's not going to cause injury like some other materials would very quickly. Um, and it's also easy to build and repair. So repairs can be made quickly if they need to be. Um, disadvantages include maintenance, um, ensuring that it is um, treated properly and maintained if it does need to be um, repaired. It is not chew proof. Um, so someone that is dealing with younger horses or has horses that are cribbers, um, they're, going, they're going to break down um, the facility more quickly. Um, it is also a potential fire hazard. So even though wood is going to be very, very common building material, again, we hit once more on why we have so many fire hazards um, in our barn and facilities. And the wood is also hard to disinfect. So if you have a number of horses coming in and out, it's going to be difficult to disinfect this facility. Um, next we have plywood. Um, an advantage of plywood is that it is very strong. Um, it requires less maintenance than planks. And it also costs less um, than planks. So looking at our previous wood that we discussed. Um, however, disadvantages would be that it is less um, attractive, so less visual appeal, and it is also important that the edges are protected um, so they don't provide a sharp, sharp point for the horse. Um, something with plywood that concerns me a little bit is a horse um, that does kick, that they can um, kick through that, and that can create a hazard. Um, so that's one of, one of my concerns that I've seen. Um, and using plywood for, for temporary fixes in some, some facilities um, that I have been in. Um, so now that we've looked at some of our um, building materials as far as our stalls um, and the overall facility, we also want to consider the flooring. Um, when looking at poured concrete, um, it is going to be very durable it is going to be very low maintenance and it is also fireproof. So very, very key um, in concrete is that it is fireproof. Um, disadvantages is it requires a poured foundation. Um, it is rather expensive. It requires um, special construction skills and it also has potential injury for horses. Um, so when looking at concrete as a form of of the facility itself and also the flooring, um, the main thing I consider is horses that are, are standing on um, a concrete that we want to make sure that we're padding those stalls appropriately um, so that doesn't develop into issues later on. So potential um, issues there for risk of injury. Um, next we have masonry as photographed. The advantages include that it is going to be, again, very durable and low maintenance. So comparable in the fact that it is durable, low maintenance, and once again, fireproof. Um, looking at our masonry and then our um, poured concrete. It's also going to be very attractive, so very visually appealing. Um, however, disadvantages include that it is relatively um, low material cost although it has a very high labor cost. So very high labor to get that, um, to get that facility um, installed. 
It requires a skilled labor to be completed, and once more, um, similar to our concrete, it is going to require a poured foundation um, before building can occur. And then, um, finally, our last one, we will be looking at metal. Um, metal advantages include that it is a simple um, and fast construction. It is very low maintenance, it's durable, and it's relatively fireproof. Um, however, disadvantages is that it can be um, very loud and noisy. Oftentimes, they're going to be cold in the winter and hot in the summer, and it's going to require um, kickboards in the stalls. So in the stalls, we don't want the horses um, to have direct contact um, with the metal. We want to make sure that we're providing a barrier um, between the, um, the barn facility and the metal um, and where our horse is located. So now that we have all of our construction um, considerations and we've considered the different types of building materials for the exterior of the facility, we also want to consider um, the stall designs. So in looking at box stalls, which are going to be most common, um, commonplace in use today, our minimum height is going to be eight foot. So again, like we talked about, our, um, we want to clear um, eight foot minimum. However, it's more common to have 10. So 10 to 12 would be ideal, but minimum um, height requirement of eight foot. Um, a standard stall size is going to be 12 foot by 12 foot. And then when we consider a full lean stall, a full lean stall should be a minimum of 16 by 16 foot. However, again, our full lean stalls are oftentimes larger being 16 by 20 foot. Another type of stall design is a tie stall. Um, these are not widely used or common today. Um, however, they worked well when horses are in for a short period of time um, and ensure that those horses eat individually. The typical dimensions of a tie stall is going to be 5 foot by 9 foot. So jumping back to our um, box stalls, because that's <clears throat> commonly what's used today, so we'll focus more on them, but wanted to provide you a little information on a tie stall. But when looking at box stalls, um, as far as flooring, there's a number of different flooring options available, um, including clay, um, stone screenings, asphalt, concrete, and stall mats. Um, so just a little tidbit there um, when looking at asphalt and concrete, those are going to be ideal in the fact that um, rodents and so forth won't be able to dig out um, or dig into the facility. However, um, they're also very, very easy to clean if need be. Um, however, it can be hard on our horse's legs. So standing on asphalt and concrete, especially on our horses that are in the stalls for extended period of times, um, isn't going to be ideal and is oftentimes going to lead to a number of different lameness issues. Um, so stall mats, um, which is what we have um, atop of our concrete here um, at the Western facility. So stall mats are going to be ideal in providing um, additional cushion. Um, stall mats are still going to be fairly easy to clean if need be. They are heavy, however, they can be moved about um, if need for cleaning or move to a um, different area. Um, as far as our door considerations, we also want to consider making sure that we have adamant space for our horses to move in and out of their stall um, and can also um, ensure the safety. There are three different styles. We have a Dutch on the far left. We have a sliding stall door in the center. And then we have a hinged stall door on the right hand side. Um, can Similar for all of these, our minimum width of a stall door, we want it to be four and a half foot. Um, and the minimum door height should be four foot. In saying that, when you look at your, your Dutch stall, we want to make sure that that bottom portion is a minimum of four, high, four foot um, high. Um, however, 
Um, a lot of our stalls are, our, our stall doors are going to be taller than that. So minimum door height of four foot. And then we want to have a minimum threshold height of eight foot. So minimum of eight foot um, for that horse to exit their stall safely. We also want to look at window considerations. So we talked about how the different um, layouts, whether you had an island or your, um, your stalls were on the exterior of your facility. So window considerations can play a, a large role in having a natural light source and also providing good ventilation to the facility. Um, standard, we want to have a two foot by two foot window. So that's gonna be standard. And all windows should be placed a minimum of six foot from the ground. So ensuring that they're elevated to at least six foot. And then our stalls should also be covered um, by a metal grate. We don't just wanna have um, an open stall. So we wanna make sure and that there's still a barrier there. As for feeders, um, we can look at um, the use of a bucket versus the use of a, um, a built-in feeder. When looking at um, the far left, we have a feeder that swings out. So this is going to be very easy to use. Um, very easy to fill our hay feeder and also our grain um, from the exterior of the stall and then provide that to our horse. Um, on the upper right, we have a protected feed area in a corner. So although this one may not um, have as good of ease as use, um, this design allows hay to be fed at the floor level while separating it from the stall manure. Um, so it's still going to keep the... Um, keep the hay and keep the grain in one location. There's actually quite a bit of studies now that we want our horses to eat in a natural head position. And when we're feeding horses um, on the left hand side, we're feeding them in an elevated feeder, um, that that's actually not ideal, that we would rather um, feed our horses where they can consume at a, um, a relaxed and a natural, um, a natural um, a natural angle and so that is where um, feeding at a lower um, lower area may be ideal so a little bit of benefit in that feeding style um, and then on the far um, right hand side lower right hand side um, we can see how um, wastage uh, of hay can occur if we don't have a barrier um, to keep that hay in a centralized location and how that can be wasteful as far as cost of hay. Um, it can also have increased time um, as we're trying to clean the stall and um, separate the hay from the, the good bedding that remains. So can can cost us money and can cost us time. Um, next, when we look at considerations of how we're providing water to our horses, we wanna ensure that they have access to fresh, clean water 24 hours a day and ad lib access at that. When using a bucket, um, it's very inexpensive. We can very easily monitor our horse's intake. Um, however, it does require daily um, labor. As we know, our horses are gonna consume about five gallons a day. And so we're going to have to ensure that we are um, filling those water buckets frequently. Um, our water buckets are also going to freeze in the cold um, which isn't ideal in cleaning those. And they've actually come out with a couple of um, heated water buckets. Not, not real confident on how I feel on electric and water in a lot of aspects, but we do have heated water buckets now. Um, and then use of a bucket is also going to provide um, ease of cleaning. So ensuring that we can provide that clean water to our horses. Um, as for a automatic water, um, the initial investment is expensive. Um, however, long term, it's going to require less, um, less labor and have a number of added benefits. Um, monitoring intake is going to require looking at the meter. We can't just quickly tell how much our horse is intaking by knowing how often we have to fill the bucket. Um, however, 
A automatic water um, requires less labor. It won't freeze um, if it's operated and installed properly. Um, however, it can flood the barn if malfunctions, so I need to make sure that even though um, it is going to be automatic that we are monitoring it, making sure um, that there isn't any leakage and also making sure that it is providing water, that it's not dry. Um, and then the automatic waters can also be more difficult to clean. This will complete your week 12 lecture content. Um, special thanks goes to Dr. Paul Siciliano as well as Dr. Jennifer Gill um, for use of this presentation. For week 12, you will need to complete your week 12A slash B assignment. So like I said, instead of having two separate assignments worth five points each, there will be one assignment worth 10 points. And then you will still have your supplemental nine assignment that will also be listed. Beyond that, make sure that you are selecting your topics for week 14 and working ahead and preparing those presentations.